Hi, everyone. I, uh, my name is Benjamin Bratton. Um, first, let me, first, let me begin my remarks on the troubled relationship between urbanism and futurity by citing the dictum by that famous British urbanist J.G. Ballard, which says that sex times technology equals the future. And for our purposes, modify it just slightly, uh, to, to, but without changing its essential meaning, I think, to political theology times technology equals the integral utopia. That is, the historical temporality of the city is, as Walter Benjamin has already argued, bound to the rhythms of theological and prophetic history. And in the guise of the city, that prophetic economy takes on the form of utopia and dystopia. In this urbanism is not only the design of systems in the spatial present, but, but for better or worse, a politico-theologic projection for which real cities exist always in some fallen simulacrum of an eventual ideal. And among these, the aspiration of security as a utopia of urban interfaces is my topic. Utopia is essentially both a political and an urban geographic function, and it not only depends upon futurity, it produces futurity as a space to be described and filled with peace or war. Unlike cities in the real world, utopias are bounded totalities, enveloped singularities, from the, juris from the Jerusalem that was the geographic center of the world, to the island jurisdiction of Thomas More, to Theodore Adorno's insistence to Ernst Bloch that the utopian impulse is not that of positive reform, but of complete transformation of the totality of what is up to and including the apparent reality of death. But what is their use today? Against the disavowals of the 20th century as a bloodbath of totalitarian utopias, Alain Bedieu demands that it was the transformative spirit even of their failure even, that must inspire even and inform a continuous push towards total transformation. So, is Frederick Jameson's oft-repeated line that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism even still true? Was it less true at the end of 2008 than now in 2010 when after the storm we have blithely resumed business as usual and officially wasted a good crisis? But we are hardly lacking in utopias and utopians capitalist, green, securitarian, sacred, and it is this surplus of utopias that presents the problem. First, let's be clear that whatever the end of history that began in 1989 and ended in 2008, it was in no way the eclipse of utopia, as some who believe themselves dispassionate pragmatists would have it. The flat earth of digital globalization was nothing if not intensely utopian. Cities, too, were adorned with a new brotherhood of obelisks, for the, to this new post-utopian order predicated on the cargo cult economics of Bilbao effects and affects. And of course, this era was also punctuated by the destruction in New York City by the utopian urbanist Mohammed Atta, whose master's degree in urban planning described the segmentation of Aleppo, Syria into Islamic and Western zones, where the immunity of the former could be protected from the dangers of the latter as well as his mortification at the mistreatment of the Twin Towers of the Gates of Al-Basir. His utopian security urbanism was to sacrifice one set of Twin Towers to save another. But what for our urbanism? Cambrian lurches forward in design ecologies tend to occur in response to an emergency, often a war. Recently, design has been asked to choose between two meta-emergencies, ecological deterioration or securitization. Lines are drawn, use cases are modeled, budgets are allocated. And now a third, the financial crisis, adds a third meta-emergency of, of a productive constraint condition against which design thinking can push. The three work in combination and in competition for prioritization, and through them, constraint is not only a set of conditions in which design must struggle, to constrain is itself a design strategy. These three crises are predicated on a shared set of technological developments and perspectives. Urban computing, ubiquitous computing, augmented reality, and so forth, turn our attention to the interfaces between urban software and urban hardware as critical design points. The realities of climatic, ecological, natural, and energy economies as limit conditions on urban systems focus attention on every point within that system 
as an interfacial transference to be interrogated, subtracted, or optimized. Then for security, the permanent emergency of potential exceptional violence recasts every partition, aperture, orifice, choke point as a site of governance for the generalized interior and the immunity of the aggregate urban body. The utopia of security might even be defined as the aspirational notion that the polymorphous, polyspatial, and polytemporal interfaces of the city can be known and governed in total and as a totality. So then it is not the utopian versus the realist, but of multiple utopias, open utopias and closed utopias, fully operational at once and co-occupying the same location, totalities on top of totalities. And in thinking about the futurity of urbanism, urbanism what I want to sketch is how this interlacing of utopias, one involving the other, even through the medium of a single urban form, defines the present. So let me quickly then touch on four sites, Mumbai, the US government, Footprint, San Diego, and Jerusalem. Consider by way of parable the attacks in and on the civilian, on civilian Mumbai by Lashkar-e Taiba, the Pakistani state within a state, armed, we believe, with an array of sophisticated but off-the-shelf personal locative media tools, satellite phones, stolen SIM cards, encrypted email, and to plan and organize the mission Google Earth and Google Maps. Lashkar's utopian urbanism is predicated on an expansive geographical vision of Dar es Salaam, whereas the cosmopolitan logic of Google and Google Earth is of a singular denuded space into which competing claims can be enveloped. I think one lesson of Mumbai is less that jihad can fit within Google Earth, but that Google Earth fits within jihad. Just as fundamentalism is a function of modernity, modernity becomes a function of fundamentalism. And the open utopia of Google Earth's cosmographic capacities are instrumentalized by fundamentalist politico-theological geographies such that one space can interweave through the other in the same projection. And again, their interweaving and interdependency produces the space of their encounter. In other words, this space of interlacing utopias is made and so entered into, not entered into and so made, or again after Adorno, but in that we travel there, the island of utopia rises out of the sea. T today we are overwhelmed by a surplus of now ubiquitous and even normative utopianism, both of openness and closeness at, the uh, at once, and this is rendered in the official symbolism of the state. While the Bush II era new embassy in Berlin by Moore, Rubel, and Udell didn't, even, didn't bother to suggest civil space or even civilian purpose, others do. Consider Karen Timberlake's winning USA embassy in London, um, quickly derided for its schizophrenic posture to the world, both transparent glass and defensive bunker at once, and ambivalent posture for glo global presence in the Obama era. Or Morphosis' Caltrans building, where dynamic expression, ex expressionistic forms look like public sculpture but perform as martial security program, decorative camouflage. Our attempts to reconcile the demands of open and closed within the same architectonic entity, whether a building or a city, means interweaving the open and the closed into one. Liberal cosmopolitan urbanity interlocked with control society partitions and surveillance sorting. Enlightenment transparency plus gated bunker a typology we might call the glass fort. And what is the effect? This interweaving of both into a single fabric and single body make for the densely reversible political boundaries and interiorities that collapse upon themselves. Unless I think for the, the vast pens of Agamben's canonical model of the camp. Instead, for soft and provisional camps, furtive moments of political exception closely sandwiched between interfaces of generalized freedom and mobility like the five minute sub airport security lines. In San Diego, the affluent global north directly abuts the global south. San Diego's self image, I think, is a little is of, of its, of its north south interface, is something like Thomas Kincaid sitting on top of a Latino children of men. But this is not true. Along with Tijuana, the border towns and the Maquiladoros, it should be seen as a single, in, indissoluble urban form bifurcated by an international border into, into two formal jurisdictions and two socioeconomic realities. The border, like any interface, activates as much energy and information as it cleaves and suppresses. And while there are persistent calls to finalize a West Bank style total wedge from the Pacific to the Gulf of Mexico, the utopia of securitization that motivates this is not possible. The border economy is so deeply and thoroughly interdependent of money and goods, labor, people, data, water, food, 
that to imagine their final disentanglement by the strong sorting central to any security of utopia is impossible. Instead, the emergent jurisdictional condition, emergent conditions of flow and networkicity continually overwhelm the zombie jurisdictions of this prophylactic geopolitics. And I'm going to skip then ahead. Jerusalem is in so many ways, I think, archetypical of this interweaving. The physical city constitutes the material signified for the sacred maps of three major religions, one layered on top of another, one woven through the other. History and prophetic future differentially activated for Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and constituted by the imaginary architectures of rebuilt temples, original foundations, polydimensional boundaries, and land rights codes, and of course, a blunt wedge introducing an artificial mountain range between spaces torturing the limits of legitimate jurisdictionality. But the boundary of this camp condition is not only the external membrane of official Israeli territory. Like the international borders held deep within landlocked airports, no nowhere near another country, and so is it inside as Jerusalem by the ubiquitous checkpoints, the political envelope of interior and exterior is repeated again and again. These checkpoints infinitely multiply the border interface by internalizing it like some self-reproducing -re fractal fold into the interfaces of everyday life, effectively dissolving the politico-theological imaginaries of civil war, of Abrahamic Abr monotheism, into the symbolic realities of everyday urbanism. Finally, it is no clearer than, I think, he, m than here than there where the secular economy is predicated on military segmentation and where military segmentation is built on a secular economy. Their association is concretized in the governed interfaces of mutual immunization. Lastly, imagine no lines is the manifesto of security experts, as in no front lines to definitively cite war and no, cl and, and, and no clear interior demarcating by exterior membrane. But this infinite smoothing is another name, I think, for what, for what Virilio called pure war. It's the same thing of, as imagine nothing but lines, where the infinity of smoothness proves upon more granular inspection to be infinite striation. The reversibility of the line and the no line is mirrored in the reversibility of the open and the closed within the same architecture. Just as for the embassies, the paired demands of open liberal democracy, its open transparent interfaces, and the Western hegemon under siege from multitudinous enemies, op opened and closed, democratic and martial, co-occupying the same structure and the same architecture, less, ju less juxtaposed than interwoven one within the other, like two solutions that won't, that won't dissolve, threads in the same quilt. So what then? Um, only more questions. Uh, is the surplus of utopias what is preventing the macro-structural political will to act on a planetary level precisely because it sublimates too much energy into the realm of the imaginary? Are these dream world fragments recuperable? If romanticism is foremost the will to a lost unity and utopia the will to potential totality, can there be an anti-romantic anti utopianism, a catastrophe without melancholy? And for cosmopolitics, can there be a true plurality of utopias? Not a totality of the multiple, but like cities or as cities, a multiple of totalities. Thanks.